What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to Bra Meets World. But it's Bra Meets World. Your boy Meets World fond cast. I am Siege. I am Tony Coitus. How you doing, sir? And uh, I'm doing well. I'm really excited about this episode uh, for several reasons. But first, I want to... Uh, introduce our listeners to our guest for this episode. Um, you may know him from his TikToks, his YouTube channel. Uh, please welcome Dimitri from The Kings. How's what it going, guys? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, tell our guests a little bit about you and The Kings and and um, why we brought you on <laughs> for this 90s episode. I do uh, The Keeg, which is like a geek entertainment kind of channel. We do a couple different podcasts, live streams. Yes, I'm on TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff. Yeah, it, it's nice to take a trip down memory lane with Boy Meets World because we don't cover that on the key. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, we cover nostalgic things, but yeah. you know, Boy Meets World, we haven't gotten to yet. Love it. And then, what is your history with Boy Meets World? Um, so when I was a kid, my mom had a rule uh, that if I wasn't a teenager, I can't watch teenage shows. I can't watch shows about teenagers. She was very close to not letting me watch Power Rangers because Power Rangers is about teens with attitude, and she didn't want any of that. She right? wanted no teens with any attitude. <laughs> no teens, no attitude. That's like the rule. I I stuck with Power Rangers, but things like uh, Boy Meets World, where it's teenagers going through their changes and they're dating and whatever, you know, my mom wouldn't let me watch that, right? And so uh, I didn't watch Boy Meets World when it was first out. But then I watched it uh, as, when I was a little bit older. I watched it on reruns on Disney Channel. Mm. And so uh, I feel like I was a little bit behind. But I feel like, yeah, I was watching it for my own enjoyment. And I watched it with my sister, who's like four years younger than me. And so we kind of like both just watched the Disney Channel reruns of it all. I love it. Like, I feel like a lot of guests uh, or a lot of Boy Meets World fans actually actually caught it while it was in syndication so many yeah. people say that they have actually found the show while it was like on the disney channel or, or uh freeform or wherever you found it uh and then also i love more than anything that your mom would not let you watch real teens learning how to deal with the real world but uh teens interacting with space zombies yeah. And, <laughs> and monsters more, and, and, and monsters. megazords. Yeah. Things you could relate to. Yeah, yeah. Honestly. I was the type of kid to like act out the things that I was watching. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess I it, like Power Rangers is a little bit better than me like acting out the trials and tribulations of Corey Matthews. I think you're better off for not having had the influence of Corey Matthews. I'm in therapy getting through the influence <laughs> of Corey Matthews, so <laughs> you're better off. Also, I just want to point out that I think, uh, you know, a common thing that we hear when we talk to our guests about how they got exposure to Boy Meets World is the syndication that happened on Disney Channel and, like, ABC Family um, throughout the 2000s and 2010s. And, you know, when we were on their podcast, we kind of brought to their attention that they were the longest syndicated TGIF show um to stay on the air post their final episode so um like i believe if you go on like mtv4 or whatever like random channels you can still <laughs> see boy meets world episodes being syndicated till this day so i mean when you compare yeah. that to like i mean some of the lesser known tgif shows like perfect strangers like i can't remember the last time i was flipping through and just saw a step-by-step -step episode just on you know what i mean like that's I'm not, the point. like, like yeah. unless i'm on like the one I might see a hanging in with Mr. Cooper episode. I might see a, you know, the Hughleys, but unless I'm outside of those black centric channels, I'm not even seeing those. So it's just interesting that, you know, Boy Meets World has had this ongoing legacy um, when they were compiled with a group of shows that had equal, if not better standing at the time. Um, they seem to be the ones that are 20 years, 30 years later, the more popular show. Were you allowed sure. to watch Sabrina the Teenage Witch? I was, I think I may have been allowed to, but. I think it was more of like growing up being like, I don't want to watch a girl show. Oh, that sort of, it was more, that was more my mentality. You know, it's not you. my mentality now. <laughs> as a kid. You know, there are girl shows and boy shows. Though, like, did I watch a bunch of Olsen twin movies? Yeah. So I don't know where the line is. You had a sister who was like four years younger than you. You yeah. had to watch all the Olsen twin movies. I, I well, like that was exactly. <laughs> exactly. I remember, I think Mary Kate and Ashley's 
sleepover is the one that like my sister's circle of friends watched repeatedly yeah. and to this day they have like a pizza song that like i still sing in my head every time i hear it and t has no siblings so no he absolutely although did you as... missed like the entire wave of american action movies you know this is a great I'm I'm glad we're finally getting <laughs> to this on our podcast because I, <laughs> no like I obviously was a huge Full House person I knew the brand of Mary Kate and Ashley yes. but I knew like the tip of the iceberg I didn't realize the empire that they had there were a few movies I saw like obviously it takes two 90s classic you know that you know we love it can't sleep re reach for the moon over the fence yeah. World series kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then the double, double toil and trouble, like, obviously, I was a huge Halloween head. So like, that always came into play. But like, I didn't realize when I like looked it up, that they have more hits than ABBA, like, their VHS <laughs> collection goes on for forever. And I'm like, I don't even know that they had like a mystery. They were solving crimes and shit. They were the first in Yola Holmes. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know that they were doing all of these things. So the fact that they were retired at like 19 makes sense they earned that retirement what of people course. don't they've done lifetimes worth of work they had book series like we yeah, that's what to the library every weekend uh with my mom and like my sister would check out olsen twin books i think i might have done that as well double double toy in trouble is 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 was a halloween right. classic that and Ernest scares Ernest scared stupid those two <laughs> Look, the rest i think he's Ernest connected Okay, we got to get into this episode, uh, which I'm really excited <laughs> to get into. This episode is a very special episode featuring the one Nobody's Angels. So if you're wondering what my background's about, it's an homage to the 90s sensation, <laughs> Nobody's Angels. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about this band and how they fit into this episode. It's so crazy, but uh, I think we need to start with a tell me about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about it. Sean explores his grief. Gets on the road with Corey to leave and encounters some angels to help Sean feel relieved. You made it work. You know, I love it when you make it work. Congrats. Um. Okay, it, so this... Yeah, is... it's, it's yeah. a struggle. This episode's kind of all over the place, but I love it, and it's a mess. Oh, yeah. This is, like, the perfect mess. <laughs> um, this is Season 6, Episode 15, Road Trip. To take his mind off of his dad's death, Sean takes Corey along a soul-searching road trip in Chet's trailer, where they end up at a truck stop where the young waitresses, portrayed by the band Nobody's Angel, are searching for something more, just like Sean. And Corey discovers that Sean has no intention of returning home. Sean must persuade Corey to let him go, just as the girl's father slash boss must let them find their own way. In a B storyline, Eric tries to understand the kiss he witnessed between Jack and Rachel, as do they. And that is the episode. Okay, Dimitri, give us your first thoughts. It was kind of a throwaway episode. <laughs> You're not wrong. Like... <laughs> Like, and then, I, like, I don't know. I jumped into this and a couple other episodes, and I was watching this one, and I'm like, why? Uh, I get what's going on with Sean, but uh, he's big, he's always so dramatic, but the whole show is. But uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, oh, it, was, it was not one of my favorite episodes, if that's the question. Absolutely. Here's the thing, and I don't blame you for that. Because this episode is so weird, especially we've been, of course, watching it. We know the whole story art. And while I understand a road trip and I understand Sean's journey of we're just losing a parent, there's so many questions that this story raises. And there's so many other ways to tell this story that I think would be better for like almost all the characters. So I don't know. I'm really excited to get into it. T, what was your first reaction? All right. So I will say this. <laughs> when this episode originally aired, I was into it. And I was into it for the same reason they shoehorned this girl group into this episode for no reason. This was 1998. Like, I can't explain to you if you weren't there what watching MTV <laughs> in the late 90s was. But it was invaded by boy bands and girl groups and pop show. Like, it, like it was 
so much the zeitgeist of pop culture and entertainment that when they showed up in this episode as a kid, I was just like, oh, I've, I've been watching MTV all day. This makes sense. When you're watching Boy Meets World, however, you're going through the storylines, you're like, oh, this seems like a really important episode for Sean to deal with his grief. The, the girl group thing feels so out of place and so shoehorned. And not only that, to have this episode where Sean is going through so much of like inner introspection of just like what this death means to him, to have Jack just be like, well, on the Rachel, not, I'm, I can't. So like, uh, all right. So, I was just gonna say, all right. So thank you. You kind of hit it right on the beginning. And I kind of want to talk about why is Sean not on the road trip with Jack? Like if ever it made sense for two characters to go on the road trip, and even like one being like, hey, I need to continue this journey. And the other one being like, I got to go back home and take care of some things. Not only would it have like strengthened their bond over losing a father and kind of like created some kind of dynamic between the two of them. And then when Jack gets back from that road trip, Eric and Rachel have kissed. And now we have a love triangle and make Rachel choose. Now we have an entire storyline that makes sense. But instead, we get nobody's angels. You know, when we were talking to the cast on Pod Meets World, I'm going to drop that every <laughs> chance I get. They, they like, writer straight up <laughs> asked us, he was like, you know, other than, like, the time travel episodes, are there any episodes that just feel like they don't belong <laughs> in the canon? And I couldn't help but think about that question when I was watching this episode. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just a mess. Uh, you brought up the time travel. I, I forgot about the, the Sabrina, the Sabrina <laughs> yeah, yeah. TGIF crossover thing. Uh, I remember that. That was wild. They travel they go to war. They go to they, war. They go. They travel in time not once, not twice, three different times throughout the series. Like I, uh, I mean, they travel in time as much as Marty McFly. You understand? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this this episode was out of place. Maybe they purposely did it on the cheap. Oh, they. Like, oh, maybe uh, that was the 100%. goal, right? Uh, oh, of course. Well, well, no, no, no. All no. Of this, this was so this cheap. Is, but this wasn't cheap. You have a swing set. Like, the fact that we have, yeah. like, another location, because that, that was another thing. Like, later <laughs> on, when we get the speech from um, Bill, played by Art LaFleur, uh, who plays the, the father-slash-boss Bill, the diner owner, he gives a speech to Sean about, hey, sometimes we lose people. You got to learn to let people go. I'm sitting here thinking, why couldn't this be Alan or Amy? Like, why did we need this stranger to come in? Or Feeny? Why Why couldn't someone that he knows tell him this exact same story where I feel like it would hit deeper than some stranger who you've never met and apparently has a weird relationship with his two daughters? I Okay, I'm going to say this. The whole, I want to go on this trip, I want to go and you know find out who my father was this person who was so nomadic who like traveled around and got to know all these interesting people always came out back with stories i want to meet these people and find out who my father was it, to me it's very big fish that whole yeah. like the movie big yeah. fish where like the dad is telling the, his son all of these stories that are so like like over the top and the son's whole journey is like i want to find the truth from all of the lies that were told that's what Sean's journey feels like to me is, is that like, I want to try to distinguish the bullshit from reality. Except Sean didn't originally go to like see more of his dad. It was random chance. You're right. That he, You're he right. Like, hey, what's that? What's, what's that picture in the background? Oh, that's a picture of my dad and that guy, that guy I just met. The guy. What? <laughs> Better writing would be, Hey, Sean is taking Corey to a specific truck yes. stop in an effort to kind of follow his father's steps and figure out if he can find people who knew his dad. But instead, he goes to a random truck stop and they're like, oh, hey, we've known your father for years. You know, I do want to talk about this a little bit because in the beginning, it almost feels like Sean is being intentionally vague about where he's going to the point where you could interpret not that they throw it out there interpret that sean had an idea of a few places he wanted to go on his road trip but he was kind of being very vague about it the thing that really kind of caught me was that the show had put 
Corey's discomfort of Sean's grief in such like a forefront for the story where it's just like, dude, we don't even know how Chet's other son is like feeling about all of this, but we know that Corey is like, he can't stop being like, Hey, sorry, your dad died. Hey, his dad died. Like, huh, I'm, I'm weird about this. I'm nervous about it. Just all this nervous energy that you get from someone who's trying to like comfort someone who's grieving. But like the show chooses to focus on that versus Jack or Sean or some of these other things. As you said, Sean's grief centered around Corey. Four random waitresses perform specifically. They dedicate a song to Corey and Sean, two people they have never met. They're not from New York, i.e. the oh, big city. They're I have from so much Philadelphia. To say. <laughs> yes, so much to say about the whole truck stop. Okay, a question for you guys. Have you ever been excited to go to a truck stop? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest. I never have, but I feel like if I looked like Sean and Corey, I might be a little bit less, less apprehensive about going to truck stops. Absolutely. You know, you're not wrong. Like truck stops have always been a little shady to me. They seem so excited. And the thing about this truck stop that drove me fucking insane the entire time, the entire time was like, they're like, as soon as they sit down, they're like, I haven't seen you two around here before. Hey, new guys in town. Hey, this goes out to our two travelers over there. You're at a truck stop. This is... This, this business is built around a nomadic lifestyle. Like, like the black girl comes out, she's like, you know, we're, we want to dedicate it to you guys or whatever. And I'm just like, what do you mean new Our guys? Wanderers. Like, they're, everyone is a new guy. Every person is traveling and stopping and leaving. Like, this whole thing of them treating it like, um, the reason why this bugged me is because in season four, there's an episode called Home. Very reminiscent yep. of this, where Eric and... Yep. Corey are on a road trip. They're exploring colleges and Eric doesn't think he's going to get into college. Um, so he stops at a rest stop and he's in the small town in this town where it's like Mayberry. Everybody knows everybody and it's very local and hometown. And they're like, Eric, you should stay. You'll do really well in a simple place like this versus the complicated city. This is not that. This is a truck stop on the route between Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, it just, it to me, it just doesn't make any sense that they keep going like, oh, like, I don't recognize you guys. It's like, of course not. Of course not. I don't know. That just drove me crazy. Pennsylvania and Ohio. Ohio's the next state over. I don't know, like, maybe they've been driving. I don't know, like, what, but four hours, five hours. It's not like we're speaking to someone in Iowa or they've been on the road for days and this is like happenstance. It's like, no, you probably hit one of the four truck stops on the interstate that you could hit. It's just insanity. I I also love that the girls, like the whole, like one of the major plot points of the episode is like, oh no, they're from, they're from the city. You're from Philadelphia. You're from the city. Oh, <laughs> we need to impress these city guys. And at one point, uh, a girl walks up and she goes to Corey. She's like, hey, is Philly a scary place? And Corey's like, no, Philly's not, not a scary place. I'm like, motherfucker, you stay in the safest, whitest part of Philadelphia I have ever seen. You have never left the 10 mile diameter between your high school and college and chubbies. Like, you think Me Meek Mill's out here lying? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I was just in Jersey like a few months ago and my parent, my dad and my stepmom, they were like, oh yeah, I wouldn't go to certain parts of Philadelphia during the daytime. I never thought like, oh, Bonnie's World takes place in Philly, but th that makes sense. Um, this is the second sitcom that Matthew Lawrence has been in that takes place in Philly. Probably love, absolutely. It's a great show, honestly. <laughs> you just can't get out of it. You just, he's like, I always got to be in Philly. Okay. He's like, he's M. Night. He's just like, I can only work within <laughs> this one state. All right, yeah. We've kind of hit on it a little bit. Do you guys want to talk about Nobody's Angels? Uh, what I thought was interesting, and I did not know this, it's kind of like a bit of a true story. They're four friends who met because they loved music. Uh, they got a big break recording a song for the Parent Trap uh, movie, Lindsay Lohan. And then they kind of became Disney darlings. Like, they were in Model Behavior with Justin Timberlake. Love uh, that they... movie. <laughs> they were on the soundtrack of 102 Dalmatians. Um, Princess Diaries, and then they also released a song for Pokemon Movie 2000. So they're kind of soundtrack queens. I did a I did a deep dive on Nobody's Angel and just watching all the like random YouTube videos and like different things like that. And then um, like I was a big fan of Pokemon, 
when I was a kid. And like, I remember the Pokemon movie soundtracks, the first movie and the second movie had like songs, a lot of songs that had nothing to do with Pokemon. Yep. Why but it <laughs> this, this song that you're talking about, the Youngstown, it's Youngstown featuring Nobody's Angel singing a really bad song. I watched, I watched a video on it and it's called Pokemon World. Movie and they're version. just like they're just like <laughs> dancing and like i don't you got to watch the video they did a live performance on a stage decked out with all this pokemon stuff it is it, it's so 90s oh absolutely. and it took place it was 2000 but it was so 90s yes and i'm so <laughs> glad you brought up the pokemon soundtrack because that's such a great example of how a franchise that has nothing to do with the boy band like craze was going on shoehorned it in i'm looking at the pokemon soundtrack right now westlife youngstown there are two songs by o-town on this soundtrack like why <laughs> like for for me during this time i was like i wanted to be in a boy band more than anything in the world that was my dream when i was 11 <laughs> i was like oh i can just dance on stage and girls are throwing panties at me i'm sign me up like, that was like such a huge thing for me so when this group appeared i was like at the time i was like yo, I love this song. This song slaps. Like, I'm still, even today, like, I was watching it and then I was in the Here's shower that. before this. I'm singing the song to myself in my head. It's a catchy tune. Do I think that four girls produced this at a truck stop in the middle of Pennsylvania? Not at all. They clearly, this is such an overly produced track. I don't know where, you are lip syncing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they could have done so much more to just be like, oh, we're going to sing a cappella. We're going to have an acoustic performance. No, we're going to do a full lip synced number to a highly produced track that clearly did not come from middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. It just, it's all all over the place. Can I ask um, you guys, um, just while we're here, um, did you have a favorite boy band of this time, our favorite girl group, our favorite pop? Like, who was the, the people you were paying attention to at this time in this genre? Oh, uh, I'll, I mean, this is an easy one. Uh, I love Backstreet Boys. I still love Backstreet Boys to this day. And Sync is good too. But if we're talking like the amount of singles, Backstreet True. Boys, all the way. So I would um, say absolutely. I was at this time in Sync. I had more connections with In Sync, like just being in Orlando. Like I had like just I was like that six degrees of separation just more overlaps with nsync so i was more of an nsync guy but as i've matured as you do backstreet boys all the way i i love both um you know i really love like the the kind of the b level the like the lfos the o towns you love, the, yes, the 98 love. degrees um, all right so <laughs> really really quickly you you had mentioned this earlier and i do want to say nobody's angels performing at the truck stop not a mic in sight, not yeah. like a uh, mic on the lapel, not a mic stand for them to even pretend. You're right. They are lip syncing. There's a voiceover. It's so crazy that they would even pretend like they're actually performing. We could have done an MTV unplugged version. If and Merle that came over sense. to a piano and just started playing <laughs> and they did like an acoustic, like show your vocals, show your skills because as far as I know, even watching this, I'm like, you can't convince me that this is a, a Milli Vanilli type of thing where like, those are your voices. <laughs> like, I'm not seeing it and you're not giving it to me, so. You know what you know what this scene seemed like? Like every summer when we would, uh, me and my sister would go on a trip uh, and we would come back and like, we would practice a song while we were away and then when we got back home we'd be like okay we're gonna sing this new Backstreet Boys song and uh that's what it seemed like to me no mics none yeah. of us, just two two like little kids singing a song that they learned that's what it. this is except with like a lot more choreo yes also I'm so glad you brought that up because that's the vibe it's like guys my daughter's <laughs> they learned this TikTok. They learned this TikTok dance. They want to perform it, guys. Can we just all just like give them five minutes? Like, by the way, they can we clear like, the, the diner, clear the <laughs> diner, and perform for like two full minutes of a twenty-minute show, which is actually kind of a lot for television. Like, they gave them so much time for this bullshit lip sync number versus them actually like. I don't know. You like when you know when you're watching like uh, Sister Act two and Lauren Hill starts singing, you're just like, oh, she's got talent. I want to hear more of this. There was none of that. And they're that like, no, nope, 30 seconds, 30 seconds max. We have a scene yeah. we have to do. 
it just seemed like they wanted to sell the pop song not sell us on yeah. this group's this group's story organically fitting into the thing it just seemed like a glee thing where it's like oh we're gonna throw the song in here so we can try to sell it uh it's this i mean they did a great job selling the song because the song's stuck in my head now oh so, it's a good song thank you thank it's you guys a, actually well, a really good that. song i'm not gonna lie about that i do want to say um just to kind of get, get back to the storyline of it sure Corey is so condescending oh you girls got yourselves a little band like <laughs> oh, he literally says this will be so cute we should see and i'm like who are you i haven't seen you pick up a single instrument why are you being condescending like you actually are barry gordy and can give these girls any kind of contract <laughs> i love that they were like well dad Corey says we're good so <laughs> exactly <laughs> It's Corey that his opinion should even matter in this. Like, I'm your father. We clearly have a history that goes far beyond the three hours these men were at our, our restaurant. Like, why do we feel like we can wrap up our entire conflict because these strangers came in? And oh, all right. So to that, I want to say, I do think it's very interesting that two of the girls are like, their dad won't let us go. What do you mean by that? <laughs> like, They can't go. You are free to go, <laughs> so just do that. There, There's that one line, it's really weird in this episode, where they're like, oh yeah, your dad was here, and he used to say that uh, one of my girls would be a great girl for Sean, and then they're like, who is it? And then, is it Amy Sue that's just like, it it's was me. Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. It was a Sarah? One. Okay, it was me. And, and that's also like, the one, he used to show us photos of you all the time. I like the one where you're bathing in the sea. You mean when yeah. he's a baby? Yeah. <laughs> what What are you saying? I, I love the joke um, where uh, Bill comes out and he's like, hey, do you see Amy Sue over there? That's my daughter. And Corey's like, lucky man, which is a weird thing to say to a guy who has a cute daughter. Um, and he goes over and he's like, you see that girl over there? She's my other daughter. And Corey says, you must have quite the gun collection, which I also thought was a funny joke. And then he that is a to, funny line. He points to the black girl and Corey goes, let me see you explain that one. And I, I literally, <laughs> I did laugh. I was like, you know, Corey actually has some pretty solid jokes in this episode. Absolutely. But then they use Sarah being like, we're all that dad has. We're like, and we don't want to leave him. So it's kind of like a little bit of like, Bill's getting all of the blame, but actually sure. Sarah's the one holding them back. Yeah. yeah, and I just, I think to your point, like, they didn't write that character as sympathetic the dad as they should have, but we're also, like, introduced to, like, seven new characters all at once, and we just don't have the time. This whole episode feels so shoehorned to include this girl group, because let's hypothesize, if this girl group wasn't available for this episode, how would they have done the story? It would have been far more deeper into the characters. It would have probably explored Sean and Chet's history a lot more. We just would have had so much, like, I think half this episode is taken up with this girl group subplot that has nothing to do with the characters of the show. I feel like if there was a script that existed before they got, you know, they booked Nobody's Angel, uh, it would have been a very similar story, maybe with like a daughter that wanted to go to the big city and just one daughter and the father wrote letter. <laughs> yeah. And then the father, like, I feel like in an original script or a alternate timeline, uh, they could have explored the father's relationship to Chet yes. and tell Sean stories that he's never heard before about his father. And then the daughter would have been like, hey, Sean, you and my father are getting along so well because he sees you in, or his, your father and you, you they were best friends you could convince my dad to let me go to college or something in the big city yeah and then it's just more of a character episode instead of the wasted time and like split dialogue across four new girls where each one gets like one one sentence every scene i was just like I don't know. I, I didn't really care for uh, this this truck stop thing. All right, so let's talk about the B storyline, which is Jack and Rachel have just kissed. As far as they know, Eric doesn't know, and they're like, like "We not we got to talk about it." Um, they have I, the I'm, I'm sorry. Can I stop you real fast, bro? I'm so sorry. To, I'm so sorry. Go for it. Again, I've been talking about this for a few episodes, so forgive me, Dimitri, for just kind of harping on this uh, to you now. Um, 
the thing that's I feel so like cheated by is this idea that we had Jack have this really strong emotional moment of I'm never going to get to know my dead father, which should take an episode or two to deeply explore. But what we get is one scene of him finally talking about his feelings, making out with Rachel, and then that's all he focuses on from this point out. And for Eric to be kind of mean to Jack in this episode and kind of like, I don't know, a little cold to him, at, at which I get it. He's like, I, I mean, we'll get into Eric's thing. I don't even wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna say, I will let you go on the rant for Jack. I'm sorry, yeah, but stop, stop, not, stop. I do not feel like Will is, I feel like Will actually plays it completely understandable in this, in this. I don't feel like he's being cold or a dick. I feel like he's just aware and he, he's kind of like there's more here than you guys were ever going to talk to me about like that's how he comes in he again when he walks in and they're like they don't say anything they're kind of like hey eric and he's like oh by the way i saw you guys kissing you were never going to say anything to me you were just going to let me walk around like an idiot so instead of doing that i'm going to acknowledge it and we're going to have a conversation which, which i thought, I was... thought was yeah. but it... to your point okay what you just said is why i think it's so upsetting that they didn't have Jack be the one on the road trip. Yeah. You just said, he was like, I will never get to know my father. In the other scene with Sean, they're like, oh, hey, we uh, we are strangers who actually knew your father for years, and we've been told stories about his kids and his kid's best friend. Why couldn't Jack be the one on the road trip? And Jack gets this moment of hearing about his father, how much his father actually followed him and cared about him and there's this bonding moment but it can even be one where jack has a bonding moment he meets bill he's hearing all these stories or even all the stories are about sean none of them are about jack and that's why sean stays on the road trip and jack's like you know what this guy never cared about me goes home makes out with rachel now the story makes more sense yeah. you're right that they just don't give jack the space to yeah. even have his own storyline of grieving his father. Okay, so I want to talk about this briefly because I disagree with Siege in the sense that I don't think Will Friedle has any reason to be upset about anything. Eric's character, and this is why. Because Jack and Eric never once was like, well, hey, we're going to agree that, like, we're not... No, they were both actively trying to court this girl. I mean, they don't owe him an explanation, but, like... I think he feels like when when you're when you're in a group of three, and then two people start hooking up, now you're alone. This is something we've yeah. actually seen in Eric. This whole season is him feeling isolated, him feeling like he's not very popular. He doesn't have a lot of friends. Um, he's trying to find his place. It was interesting because like two episodes ago, there was a scene where Rachel and uh, Eric were playing this like newlywed game, and they did really well. And Eric's like, you know, me and Rachel are vibing and I don't really know how to break it to Jack that like we're going to become a thing. He kind of like he kind of misinterprets a lot. Um, but the entire time was him just struggling with how to tell Jack about it. And I think what we're seeing is the fact that Jack wasn't feeling that towards Eric of like, oh, how am I going to talk to Eric about this? And again, to his point, to Eric's point. They did not only lie to him about it when he asked, as soon as he left, they made out in the living room as if to say, if he comes back, fuck it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, it was just very, just careless the way they went about handling it. I'm going to, I'm going to give him a benefit of a doubt. I'm going to say that Jack and Rachel quote unquote meant what they said in the moment they were like we're just friends it's platonic it is they're in denial right and then when they leave they look at each other and they just get caught up and they're like ah uh, let's just i ah uh, okay i get it but here's the thing i here's like even if they did to tc's point eric has just like he is not at the elevator door he's not at the laundry room they didn't make sure that they didn't, no one like heard him walk down the hallway he shut the door and they were like i want to kiss you and they just went at it Eric could have been like i forgot my laundry detergent and just walks in on this immediately there is no yeah. discretion it's just a story of conflict and betrayal and to your point tc 
Eric specifically thinks about how to tell Jack and Jack's first reaction is never tell Eric. Well, what's interesting and is that Jack doesn't different. even want to have the conversation with Rachel. Like, he's trying to avoid even getting into this, which makes sense because he has a lot on his plate right now. He has a lot bigger things to focus <laughs> on and worry about and process than what this kiss was. So him being avoidant to that conversation makes sense. So I, I there's just a lot of just, like, di- like not being completely upfront between boys that's yeah. happening here. I've been there. And so, like my first ever, my first ever girlfriend when I was in high school, it was like we were all best friends. It was me, my best friend, her. We used to hang out like all the time. And but what ended up happening is obviously like at the first hookup, I tell my my guy friend, right? There wasn't secrets per se, and also we weren't both pursuing the same girl. It wasn't like that. So, you know, the very similar personalities though, the three of us. I was obviously the Jack. <laughs> obviously. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. You know? Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, they got to spice it up for the for the TV drama, right? It's actually funny. Secrets. You just reminded me. I actually, T, did you have this situation? Because I had this situation in college where it was me, a friend. It was me and this female friend. We both, uh, we both were pursuing this one guy. And... It was like this whole thing of like the entire time, which one of us is he more interested in? Because like it's college and we didn't really know and he hung out. Like he gave me his number, but like, you know, when we went out, she was there and we were like, we just didn't know how he, he, what he was going to pursue. And and eventually it became this thing where it's like they paired off and I felt left out, but then our friendship was stronger. And so he became our third and it's like this whole weird triangle that i completely forgot about so it's true to college um the only thing else i wanted to say is t you brought up something which i really am connecting with which is eric's feeling of loneliness or if we look at it each one of these characters jack rachel eric they're all lonely in some kind of way rachel knows no one but her roommates Jack knows no one but his brother and his roommates. Eric doesn't have any other support system because his family pretty much ignores him and Corey and him almost never overlap. So he himself is feeling lonely. And so like this idea of loneliness and lonely people finding each other and what happens when three lonely people find each other and two of those people have like a sexual spark, that's a great storyline that we could have done. There's a lot of better choices. I think that's that's the thesis, right? Like, there's the better choices the writers could have made. Why are they pushing X, Y, and Z? Are they lazy? Are yes. they, like, <laughs> what, are, what are the parameters that they're working in? You know, I think they even talked about this on Pod Meets World, maybe. Or, or maybe it was a different interview where they were talking about how Sabrina was able to get Backstreet Boys. Um And I think there was this push to like put a pop group on there and they specifically wanted to get a female group to counter the largely male centered cast that's on Boy Meets World. But like, this is a prime example of just like, we're trying to figure out a problem that doesn't even need to be a problem. Like, why are we trying to (laughs) shoehorn any of this into our show? Like, clearly it's for ratings, but like, if you're gonna go for ratings, why not get Britney Spears? Why not get Christina Aguilera? Why not get someone who has name recognition that will actually pull in an audience to justify writing an entire episode around a pop group? And like, where's Destiny's Child? Like, bring someone else in here that has name recognition. (laughs) There are four black women in ohio come on (laughs) (laughs) okay uh i do want to like wrap up this episode sure sure. um this is going to be very interesting i just want to what was your bra moment uh and dimitri again a bra moment is like what moment just kind of like took you out of the episode where you were like wow uh wow in a negative way whichever one uh like again uh, just kind of like (laughs) i i haven't i haven't talked about this specifically but like the way they film the choreo and the dance and everything, it's classic, like, like one second shot. <laughs> and then, you know, like, yes. you know, like a rolling the eyes while singing a song and then doing all that stuff. 
that takes me out because I'm like, this is a show about a boy meeting the world, right? <laughs> and now we're 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 trying to like do very limited camera angles on this set, mm-hmm. but also splice it in in like two second shots Absolutely. because I don't know. Uh, that I think took me out of the whole thing. That specific thing. I always mm-hmm. love that they when they have like a band or like a dance group who like they're practicing choreo but they look at each other like oh you know we <laughs> just do this dance <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it, it was a total glee performance of we've never done this song before but we're going to perform it like it's just like second nature like it just it felt exactly. very glee um you know my- unless oh yeah. unless they do do it all the time Everybody in the in the truck stop has been there before, and they watch it like a hundred times a day. And yeah. every time there's a new person, they're, they're like, "Did you take us to the big city?" <laughs> <laughs> and then like they're doing multiple shows. You they know? Have <laughs> one song, one song that they do like every two hours, like it's a Shamu show. And yes, <laughs> these people at this restaurant are tired of seeing and hearing it. Yes, I love you said like a Shamu show. Like yeah, like that's the two o'clock. I like and also Luigi. I like your idea that they just honestly they just do this every single. Day. It's it's actually a grift with Bill. <laughs> where like every single time Bill is just like, hey, stay away from my girls, and the girls are like, help us, please, and they just like they're racking up money and donations. Yeah, the only re- way this show, this episode, can be justified is if they wanted to do like a spinoff with these yes. characters like because that's the only time i've ever seen a show invest so heavily into a large group of new characters is when mm. they're trying to actively like do a spin-off of it and a like backdoor pilot a backdoor pilot that's exactly what the, what it's called and so like that to me makes sense like oh okay do you want to try to sh- sell the show to tgif or abc and like it's about these girls like trying to be like an s club seven kind of show like whatever like like that makes yeah. sense other than that None of this belongs in Boy Meets World. Yeah. Okay, T, what was your bra moment? There isn't like a traditional bra moment that we have of just like, oh, I don't think this ages well. Like, I feel like this wouldn't fly today. But I did feel like Rachel and Jack making out with Eric as he just walked out of the room was kind of like a, bro, what are you doing? What about you, Siege? I, I do feel like the whole, my favorite photo of, is of you in the bathtub it's, it's just a weird thing to have a female character say um so that was one of my eyebrow moments and then honestly if we want to talk about things that just kind of like took me out of the episode i can't get over the fact that jack is not mentioned at any point in time when we are talking about chet and his kids yeah. and they they specifically bring up that he knows about Corey. so it's like you're either saying that Chet specifically chose to ignore Jack, or again, it's lazy writing and you didn't even acknowledge that Chet had two kids. Or in like an episode so, where the second child is mourning. <laughs> the very least, they could have looked at Corey and be like, are you Jack? And he could have just been like, no, I'm Corey. <laughs> like something like that would have just at least made it seem like Chet mentions his other kids and he doesn't have one kid that he, he takes ownership of, kind of. And then just he doesn't even take on the show. <laughs> I feel like this is like Chet has a very Nick Cannon approach to fatherhood. <laughs> <Where it's- laughs> okay, uh, Feeny Tommy, what is the lesson of this episode? I feel like the lesson of episode is something that's that's in a lot of things. They're always like when people pass away, they are no, they're not gone. Yeah, they're still with you. I mean, they literally spell it out in this episode. Yes. And it has been in other things, right? That is classically just a lesson that we see a lot of time. Um, but I did like I did like the fact that like like Chet appears. You know, it's yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's sad. It's it's it, it it hit me a little bit, right? Yeah, I've seen it before, but it it still it still gets me. Yeah, for I, sure. I want to give that to uh, um, the actor who plays Chet because I feel like. Again, I've I've always said this. I'm a chat apologist. He is just so charming. And you you just literally never get tired of seeing him, no matter when he shows up. And I think that that's a lot about his performance that, yeah, even seeing his ghost, you're like, man, I'm really glad I got to see that. No, for sure. Um, see, what do you think the Feeny lesson is? Um, you know, <laughs> what the Feeny lesson should be is 
um, you know, it's okay to gr gr grieve in your own way that if you want to make jokes, yes. if you want to laugh, if you want to go and kind of like explore life on your own, like all of that's okay. There's no proper way to grieve. And that kind of would even make sense for Jack's storyline, even though I, I just don't feel like the show kind of pushes that. The main message I got is that if you're in a girl group and you want to make it, you got to go to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> like that is the <laughs> message that most of the show is about. So like, I, I really just don't know what I'm supposed to walk away with other than like, also it's okay to lie to people about, your relationships that you have behind their back like i i don't really know based off of the characters actions what i'm supposed to be walking away with but i think dimitri hit it closer with just that you know no one's gone if once they die i love yeah. that you're like if you really want to make it if you can impress just two random college students boy you're on your way to the top <laughs> I love when you okay. called a Corey uh Gory Berry, <laughs> Gordy Berry, uh, Barry Gordy. I'm sorry, Barry Gordy. <laughs> when you were like, oh, they're treating Corey like he's Barry Gordy, I'm like, yes, this makes no sense. Who is this guy <laughs> that you need to I can't I can't keep going back and forth. Okay. Um, so and to me, I was gonna say my feeding lesson is more of like learning to let people go. Mm. Uh, you know, like that's another yes. part. Of yeah, chat. Uh, sorry, Sean learning to let Chet go. Uh, Corey learning to let Sean go. The dad learning to let the girls go. Yeah. And in some way, if you want to, Eric really going, he's starting their journey of having to let whatever this triangle is go. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's just kind of like what I took away from it. But you're right. It's nothing's really spelled out the way that it should be. Um, so yeah. All right. What grade are you guys giving this episode? Uh, I got to give it a D. Mm. I gotta. I. I. If I could have, <laughs> like, if I was watching this as it was airing, I would have been like, I should have skipped this week. Like, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, no, you, I want my time. Imagine back. waiting week after week for a new episode of a show that you like, and then this episode comes on. You're like, oh. You know, can I just say, one of my earliest memories as a kid was, um, it was a Friday night and my mom had brought me over to her friend's house and they wanted, they were like watching sports or something. And I remember like crying to my mom, mom, can we please go home? I'm going to miss Boy Meets World. Like, I'm going to miss Boy Meets World. Like, it was such a big thing because I, like, even as a kid, I was just like excited to see the show. But that whole thing of just like, well, you have to make it home in time. So if you rearrange your plans and you rush home and it's a shit episode, you're like, what did I do all this for? Um, so I, I can understand that. Uh, T, what grade are you giving it? You know what? I'm going to give this episode a B, which is very forgiving. Very wow. forgiving. Wow. This episode oh. should not be a B episode. For all of the reasons that we've discussed, it's so random. It's so all over the place. But the fact is- How did you is, settle on B? <laughs> because, bruh, if you don't think for the rest of the day, I'm going to be singing to myself, I just can't help myself, I'm falling in love with you, then you're wrong. Like, that's why this episode <laughs> got the B, because the song slaps. Like, that. the song is the thing that is going to make this episode memorable when it has no reason to be. So for that reason alone- like, yeah, it wasn't probably the most uh, uh, popular group at the time. You probably could have got more ratings with something else, but I can't deny that the song's a hit. So for that reason, I'll give it a B just to kind of forgive a lot of the other shit. And one thing I just want to quickly point out that we forgot to mention that I was talking to Siege about was, you know, what uh, we have uh, the actor who plays Merle, who's like the guy with the, with the beard. We have Bill, the guy who owns the place. And we have Blake Clark, uh, who is Chet Hunter, all three of which played like Tim's friends on Home Improvement. So there was just a lot of crossover between the Home Improvement set and the Boy Meets World set with them being right next to each other. I mean, even Amy started off as yeah, Jim's I was gonna best say, friend Amy. on Home yeah. Improvement. So the fact is, is that like whoever's casting that show is clearly very close to whoever's casting the show because we got three different Home Improvement um kind of alumni so to speak within this one episode but um yeah b, b they weren't b. the same networks were they yeah yeah so, home improvement network, was on tuesday line. night that no that's the thing is that <laughs> home improvement and eventually full house like got so popular that they took them out of the friday night lineup and they moved them to tuesdays um but if you know this home improvement in terms of subject matter is actually far more in line with boy meets world than a lot of like full house and family matter stuff um 
they're they're a little bit more mature in their storytelling sometimes especially as the kids get older um but yeah there's just a lot of crossover there but b episode is my grade just to bring it back wow. home okay Beach. okay okay i'm giving it a d plus and the plus was for the song like okay. i was with the where i was like this was a d episode but because because of the song, because the song was good, I was like, I'll give it that plus. So, <laughs> also, it might be different nowadays where if I want to listen to a song, I can just go online. But imagine liking the song and being like, where can I hear it again? I just got to like find out when this episode is. Remember the TV guide? Yes, yes. of course. You gotta, like, yes. you gotta, I lived like, by that a, thing. A little synopsis. Maybe you're yeah. like, oh, this is the episode. I'm going to wait, you know, three Looking months at the TV to guide hear the song like, again. No boy meets world i gotta see that you know what's so funny is that you bring up a great point that before there was even like the guide button on your remote which was something that we encountered as a technological like revolution at the time there wasn't really a way other than that tv guide of knowing what was on and even then the synopsis was so brief because it had to fit in like such a small point that television was in a lot of ways, I think a lot more like what TikTok is now in terms of just like you're scrolling and you're looking for something and you're finding something that's entertaining, but it's all about the discovery more than actually like seeking out content, um, which is a completely different than how we approach television now. Um, it just feels like they've allowed so much more uh, room to discover new things by providing, you know, now we have full websites dedicated to like, what's what what's going to happen in season two of Miss Marvel? Let's find out. Like all of this like speculation, whereas before there was none of that, that didn't exist. So I... I think there there is something uh, when you said the TV guy thing, it just kind of brought me back to a time where we I had a very different relationship with television because there wasn't all the um, options that we have now. It's actually really it, funny. You just made me realize I've never thought of it as TikTok like channel surfing, but that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, also, like the way they write episodes back then, um, given the time period and the constraints of television is different. That's why like when they go to commercial break and they come back from commercial break, they redo the last five seconds sometimes. Right. Yeah. Like if it's a big thing, they're like, maybe you just came into the show. Can you imagine that though? Like attack, like, like attacking a show, like, Oh, we got to do them in like five minute chunks. And maybe yeah. you didn't watch the previous five minutes of the episode. <laughs> yeah. that is, you're right. That's that's kind of crazy. I never thought of it this way. This is all I don't know. We started to examine television. That's but that's one of the things that I want to say. It's like this episode has been interesting to watch and discuss with you guys, but not because of the story, but because no. it's just got us so distracted to start thinking about like what kind of world were we living in where we would get a show like this? Like yes. what kind of <laughs> what kind of universe did we have where we are getting haphazard storytelling, pop stars being thrown into the middle of a TV show? Like what what universe does that kind of machine create? Yeah, all in a 22 minute um, episode, you know? All in a 22 minute episode. Okay, so you guys finally homework what do you got like dimitri what homework do you have for our audience i'm watching okay this is weird i'm watching how i met your father because i never gave it a shot when it first came out but season two's out and i'm like okay i i will i'll bite the bullet and i'll give the first season a shot because i watched how i met your mother religiously back in the day but i can't go back to it <laughs> i'm a huge sitcom fan i'm a you huge sitcom fan. cannot revisit i can't go show. back I can't uh, for for multiple reasons because the uh, the end of that series messes up things so bad. Yes, I can't watch it. And then also Barney I as a character, as an I, ex as an entity, Barney ruins that show. Yes, like it. I get it. Back when I was younger, I was like, "Ha ha, that's like the dickish kind of humor." Okay, yeah, that's funny. Uh, the bro code, super funny, super hilarious. And then now I'm like, oh, I, I can't go back. It's it's different. So how uh, how much your father? I'm a couple episodes in. I'm watching it with my mom. It's more risque than how I met your mother. Yeah. Like I've seen it. One of the guys essentially. Wait, how appropriate is this show? This podcast? Oh, go for it. We curse all the okay. time. Okay. He's wearing the fleshlight. He's wearing like <laughs> As he as he walks out of the room, he's wearing a flashlight. 
Uh, it's a bigger flashlight. It looks like a Good for him. It looks like an ice, <laughs> like a like a ice cream maker kind of thing. But whatever. Um, but like it's it's anyway. Whatever. The point being is, sorry. Side note: My mom was like, "Are those? Is that is that a real thing?" And I'm like, "I don't, I don't know." I can't I have know. this conversation with you, mom. Are I we can't. doing this? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. We're not gonna. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, but but I just finished. Uh, I finished a lot of shows. I finished Atlanta season four. Oh, okay. now is it? Great, great. That, the, the the goofy um, movie episode of that season will stay with me forever. I love it. That was the. None of the episodes make sense in Atlanta. Like when they're they do that standalone stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, do people coming in? They don't know what is going on. That episode is wild <laughs> i was at a bar i was at a bar just a dive bar and they were playing fx and multiple episodes like standalone episodes of atlanta went back to back and i'm like anyone watching this that would not know what this is absolutely yeah. it's surreal it's literally surreal television t what's your uh homework you know, this is something you've been giving us homework for a long time, and I finally got around to, like, deep diving it, and I'm almost done with it, but I am now completely obsessed with Abbott Elementary. I've gotten through yeah. to, like, most of season two, and at this point, I, like, I get it. It's the Black Parks and Rec, and I love yeah. it. It's such a joyful show, and one of the reasons why, you know, I think you've talked about this before, and I'm finally kind of seeing the the connection, is, you know, so rarely... Do we have shows that focus on school and education and teachers? And one of the things that we all connect with as Boy Meets World fans is the fact that that Feeney relationship was always taken so seriously and they kind of explored, you know, what it was like to kind of grow up in a, and go through school in a way that we can all relate to in a way that television doesn't really talk about too much you know even on saved by the bell the education was just kind of in the background while these hijinks were going on versus it kind of playing a role in these kids lives and you know to kind of connect that to Abbott elementary to kind of see this all from the teacher's perspective entirely is very interesting and having them having to deal with charter schools and like low funding and like you know i have a classroom disruptions and like all these things like half of my family, like not half of my family, but a lot of my family are teachers and they work in schools and they work with kids. And these are all stories I've heard them kind of told, tell me in ways that just kind of um, make me relate to the storyline so much stronger. So like, yeah, if you, and that's the thing, I, I say Black Parks and Rec because if you understand Parks and Rec in the terms of like, hey, The Office is very cynical, but Parks and Rec was very optimistic and like kind of gave you a joy. Like you, these people wanted to serve the public. They wanted to do good. Leslie wants to do good. You can see those same characteristics kind of, you know, within the cast of Abbott Elementary where everyone has their quirks, but even the principal, for example, is doing her best and is lovable and you want to, her to succeed and you want all of these characters to do well. And it, I just think it's a great ensemble comedy and uh, a, a, probably the strongest ensemble I've seen in a long time. So yeah, Abba Elementary season two. Abba Elementary will always get my praises. The, the idea that like, and I only realized this as I grew up, the idea that like our parents, our teachers are just as clueless yeah. Like, like they're also going through growth. You think the pinnacle of 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 like the totem pole is like these authority figures that you've been looking up to your whole life. Mm -hmm. You've been get getting lessons from, and sometimes they're making it up on on the fly as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That moment uh, you realize, like, I mean, especially for me because I'm I'm an only child. But if you guys are the oldest, that feeling of like, oh, my parents had never done this before. Like I grew up looking for them for all the answers of like, but they've never been a parent before me. So they have no way of knowing how to do it. That kind of realization of just like, wow, like everyone's faking it till they make it is is like, it's 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 a little like nerve wracking, but also kind of comforting because like being in, your, in my thirties now and like feeling like I don't have my shit figured out. is like, oh, everyone feels this way in some perspective in some avenue of their life. It's right. so funny. Like the number of times I like, anytime I speak to someone younger, they're like, telling me about this decision they have to make and they feel like it's so heavy i'm like i need you to understand nobody knows what they're doing yeah. <laughs> just make a decision and if anything like even if it's the wrong decision making the decision is absolutely the better thing to do um so yeah okay my homework this week uh 
I'm actually surprised that it's my homework because I was surprised by it, but it seemed very fitting um, because we we're talking about big city guys going out into the country. I watched Tulsa King on Paramount Plus with Sylvester Stallone. I'm not it was from- a show that I did not think was my type, but let me give you this breakdown. Sylvester Stallone plays a mobster who has been a New York mobster who was in jail for the last 25 years because he kind of like took the fall for the rest of the gang. But he gets out and they're like, look, New York is different. The mob doesn't have the hold on New York like it used to. We have nothing for you here, but we can send you out to Oklahoma and you can start to build something out there. And he's like, what's going on out there? What can I do out there? They're like, that's for you to find out. That's like why we're sending you out there. So you get like this New York mobster who moves to Oklahoma and basically tries to start a gang there. And it's this weird thing. (laughs) I will will not lie. I only watched it because I've always had a crush on Sylvester Stallone. And like literally the first 30 minutes, I'm like, I'm only watching it because like this gives me some kind of comfort level just to watch him. But it actually, as I watched the series, it's like, oh, it's actually doing really interesting things. Like, very early on, they have, you know, he gets a black sidekick. And I was like, oh, boy, what are you going to do here? But, like, they explore police brutality while throughout the series. And they kind of constantly have the black associate be pulled over for no real reason. They show police, like, encroaching upon him they have uh indigenous land and they talk about like what the police are like there it's a very interesting thing because you get all of these like symbols of both past and present storytelling so you have indigenous people you have non-binary people you have um police brutality like conversations on police brutality but then you also have monsters and you have guns and you have someone like a boomer sylvester stallone saying things like, I don't get pronouns. And you're like, why are we having this conversation? There was no real reason to have this conversation, but also you kind of made it all work in a way that I'm invested. And I I just was so surprised by this show, but I actually absolutely recommend it as something to watch and check out. All right, so thank you guys. All right, so Dimitri, tell everyone where they can find the Keeks, where they can find you, everything that uh, you want to share with the audience. Yeah, so if you like geek stuff, um, um, yes, we deal with a, a lot of nostalgia, but it's comics, movies, TV, pop culture in general. Um, we have multiple shows a week, but you can find all our information on our social media at The Keeg Show, uh, T-H-E-K-E-E-G-S-H-O-W. Uh, TikTok and Instagram are our big ones. Yes, we're on Facebook. Yes, we're on Twitter. But, you know, TikTok, Instagram, two big platforms. Um, we do live streams and podcasts. So our live streams are on Twitch and YouTube, so twitch.tv slash the Keeg Show, uh, youtube.com slash the Keeg Show, or you can uh, listen to us on, on uh, podcast format, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher now. So uh, pretty much at the Keeg Show or slash the Keeg Show uh, anywhere, and you can find us, you can track us down, and uh, we're doing like a Mandalorian season three after show, because uh, we do a lot of after shows for those type of shows. Um and then, yeah, we got a lot of shows that we do. So definitely follow us and figure it all out. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I really enjoyed having you on. It's Absolutely. been such a pleasure to like actually, you know, again, we've been following each other. So to like collaborate, it's always yeah. fun and, and great. Yeah. Love I thought you this on, day bro. would never great come, vibe. but I made it. Yeah, you made it. We're, we're happy to have you. We're so happy to have you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Uh, so for our listeners, as usual, you can find us at Bra Meets World on all the places, pretty much anywhere that you did slash the King show. After you're done watching that, back that up a little bit, do slash Bra Meets World. You'll be able to find us yeah. uh, on all the places. Make sure you leave us a rating. We appreciate you guys so much. Uh, and this is the part of the show. King, I'm going to see if you remember your homework. This is the time where... <laughs> Give you a little second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. Uh, everyone, uh, this is time we ask you to dream. To try. Do good. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> Later, bruh. Later, bruh. When the spawn meets world.